Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thank you for joining us. Hey, I was having a conversation with one of our longtime viewers, Tyson C., and we were talking about this story here. And in talking about that, we were talking about how essentially this entire Puget Sound region has kind of gone to hell in a handbasket on us. And this happens with far too much frequency. So let's talk today about how much force can I use when protecting my catalytic converter. Okay, before we get rolling, you guys know the drill. If you like this video, go ahead and click that like button down below. If you want to stay up to date on issues related to your second amendment rights, go ahead and click the subscribe button down below. Click the little bell logo if you want to be notified when we post new videos. And most importantly, let's keep the comments and discussions coming. That's how we're going to make sure we get our videos out to more lawful and responsible gun owners like yourself. Okay, as we are aware, I did stories to find out that catalytic converter theft is up in the Puget Sound region by approximately a thousand percent. We also find stories like this about two brothers who were stabbed while trying to thwart a catalytic converter theft. And then, of course, Dateline, January 17th in beautiful Bellevue, Washington, we all saw this story about a couple who was awoken at 5 in the morning to find their catalytic converter was being stolen. However, the uh, individual who was stealing it also had another individual with them who was covering their door with a firearm. Um, so this brings up the question. Obviously, these things are expensive items. What are catalytic converters? Catalytic converters are devices which are installed to our vehicle's exhaust system, which will take otherwise very poisonous and toxic gases, which are, which are emanating because of the combustion within the engine, using chemical reactions, primarily through very precious metals. They will then convert those very toxic gases into more innocuous emissions, such as CO2 and water vapor. Now, now, for thieves, they love these catalytic converters because of the precious metals that are contained therein. Now, there is a state legislator who is really trying to crack down and has proposed a new bill to, it's going to really crack down on these catalytic converter thefts because he's really going to go after the thieves, right? Uh, no, actually what he does is he wants to go over the scrap metal yards because he believes that they're complicit in this. So rather than going after the actual people doing the, the stealing and the destruction of private property, uh, this individual wants to go after the scrap metal. Now, whether or not that legislation is a good piece of legislation, we'll let another channel deal with that. What I want to talk to you guys about today is what happens when you wake up at three in the morning and you realize someone's rummaging around in your driveway and you look out there and now you realize, oh my God, someone's trying to cut the catalytic converter out of my car. How much force do we get to use? Okay, so to get you to understand how much force can be used in this situation, we're going to actually use a couple of real life examples. Yeah, we're going to use the example from Bellevue just earlier this month. And we're also going to use the example of Mr. Mike Campbell down in Tacoma who also discovered that his catalytic converter was being stolen and perhaps reacted with a disproportionate amount of force. Now, let's take a step back. We know under Washington law that any force that we use has to be necessary, has to be reasonable, and it has to be proportional. We also know from Washington law, and those of us who've been watching this channel for a while, and we'll put the link for the video down before, that we cannot ever ever use lethal force to defend only property. So as inconvenient as this is, and if you get your catalytic converter cut out of your car, the ride is over, and in order to replace it, you are going to be out several thousands of dollars. Okay, so to get you guys to understand how use of force can be used here, let's come up with a couple of basic rules that we all can agree on. First, under RCW 9A.16.020, we do have the right to use reasonable and proportional force to defend a malicious trespass onto our property or the, the unlawful taking of our property. We also know under RCW 9A.16.050 that we can use lethal force if a felony is being committed upon our person or in our abode. And this is important. In our abode means inside the home. It does not mean out in the driveway. So the typical scenario that we have is someone is awoken middle of the night to rummaging in the driveway. 
They look out the window, they see legs sticking out from under the car, they realize that their catalytic converter is being stolen. Do they have the right at this point to use some force to defend that property? Absolutely, they do. They have the right to immediately announce their presence, to immediately order the person off the property. They could even order the person to remain there so that they could contact law enforcement. Could they go up, grab the legs, and yank the person out from underneath? Yes, they could. All of these are reasonable uses of force. But let us remember now, for every action, there oftentimes is an equal reaction. So as we begin to use force, we place ourselves in jeopardy of having force also being used upon us. Now, in situations where we use a reasonable amount of force to thwart the theft and the individual takes off, do we have the right to continue to use force in that situation? No, actually we don't because the threat now is done, okay? However, in instances where we use a reasonable amount of force to thwart the theft and now the perpetrator turns that unlawful force upon us, that is they start attacking us, do we have the right to use for further force in defense of ourselves? Yes, we do. And if we are placed in the imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury, we do have the right to use lethal force. So what's the most common example? Person goes out, confronts the catalytic converter theft. The thief pulls out from under the car, now pulls out some sort of a weapon, be it a knife, a pipe, something like that, threatens the individual. Does the individual at that point have the right to use lethal force? Yes, they do. Now, am I saying absolutely positively pull the trigger? I'm never saying that on this channel. I'm telling you what you probably have the right to do. But again, we talk all the time about what we have the right to do and what we should do and how oftentimes those two answers are different. Now, let's take a couple of real life examples. Let's take this case from just last week in Bellevue. The individual awakens to find not only is their catalytic converter being stolen, but an individual is essentially sweeping the front door with what is presumed to be a loaded handgun. Is the individual inside that home now placed in imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury? I think we could all agree that they are. And is there a felony that's being committed upon them inside their abode at this point? There arguably is, which is felony assault. When you point a loaded firearm at a person, that is usually considered to be assault in the second degree when you do it without lawful authority. Can that individual in that situation potentially open fire on them? Yeah, I believe he could open fire on the individual pointing the firearm at the home. Could they open fire on the other guy that slid underneath the car stealing the catalytic converter? I do not believe they can. Now, that's what you may have the right to do. Should you do that? Again, I defer to the individual in that particular situation, but we have to acknowledge that once we start opening fire in a residential neighborhood, fire will be returned and there are lots of would-be victims that can be struck by stray bullets. Now, compare what happened in Bellevue to the story of Mr. Mike Campbell in Tacoma, who late last year, while asleep in his Ford F-150 pickup truck, awoke to the sound of the catalytic converter being sawed out from underneath him. He then opened his door to see legs sticking out, took his handgun, and fired not once, not twice, but three times at the would-be thief. Bad enough, right? But then he took the gentleman, dragged him out from underneath the car while he was still bleeding, and by his own admission said the man was still alive and talking to him, tied him to his trail hitch, and then drug him through a parking lot and into a field where he then left him to die. Mr. Campbell was then arrested and charged with murder in the second degree. Now, I don't think you need a lawyer here to tell you everything that's wrong with this one. But the very instance that Mr. Campbell opened up the door and began to fire upon the would-be thief, he already had broken the law. Now, he just wanted to make sure that he was going to get convicted in a spectacular fashion, so he went through the rest of his war road warrior techniques. But at the moment that Mr. Campbell opened fire upon that thief, what was occurring at that particular moment was the threat to property. And granted, that property may have actually been his home as well, but it was the threat to the catalytic converter alone. Now, had Mr. Campbell gotten out of the car, confronted the individual, the individual attacks Mr. Campbell, comes at him with a weapon, and Mr. Campbell then uses his firearm to stop the threat, he in all likelihood 
would have been sitting within the confines of the law. Now, if he takes the bleeding corpse, ties it to the back of his truck, and drives it around in a victory lap, similar to what he did here, we're going to have some other problems. So the bottom line is this. This is a real problem that many of you may face. Do you have the right to use force to defend your catalytic converter? Yes, you do. Do you have the right to use lethal force to defend your catalytic converter? No, you don't. Only if that threat is turned upon you and a threat rises to a level where you are now in imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury, then and only then does Washington law permit you to use lethal force. Listen, you may have more questions about catalytic converter thefts or anything related to your Second Amendment rights. And if you do, don't ever hesitate to contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com. Or, of course, you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. want to thank Tyson C. for brainstorming this one with me. And then remind all of you that part of being a lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.